Coming up, see what it takes to walk away from an engine failure in a P-51 Mustang. And another world record for the shortest landing. Find out just how short it was. Flying a Spearman to commemorate 100 years of air mail. And flying to another time at the Stonehenge Air Museum in Montana. AOPA Live this week begins in just a moment. Build and fly with the Sonics Aircraft B models. The B models offer more room and comfort, more fuel, more panel space, more engine choices, and the same great Sonics Aircraft flight characteristics. Learn more at sonicsaircraft.com. This is AOPA Live This Week with Tom Haynes and Melissa Rudinger. The FAA is opening the door to innovation. The agency announced the final step in the Part 23 rewrites. Part 23 contains the standards GA airplanes must be certified to. The new rule moves away from the prescriptive and burdensome requirements that were previously in place. This week, the FAA announced that they formally accepted new certification standards. The new standards were developed collaboratively with the aviation industry. They give manufacturers more options for showing how their designs meet the FAA's requirements for certification. We talked to Tom Pagini of Flight Design. The company is working on a new four-seat design, and the new rules will help get that airplane to market sooner. It really, it really means that the rubber has just hit the road on the new Part 23. Um, and for a manufacturer, that means that we can go forward knowing uh, what we'll be certifying to in the future. So it's a, it's a big thing. It's a big thing for general aviation and the manufacturers. Part 23 reform should also accelerate development of innovations like electric propulsion and vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. This has been a long time coming, know, as you know. I know, you've been working on this one for a long time. More than a decade. Yes. And uh, Gamma, AOPA, and others, uh, this, was an, this was a collaborative, proactive effort to get right. some real positive change, and, and it was finally, finally coming to fruition. Right. So, I mean, what, what do we expect from manufacturers? We've got Tom Pekini saying that, you know, it's going to help them a little bit with their new design. What do you think is going to happen elsewhere? I think it's going to be critical to help get the electric propulsion right. market really up and running here in the U.S. There's been strides made in Europe. One of the things holding us back here is PAR 23. Yeah. So okay. that's probably going to be one of the biggest boons. We'll look forward As well as hopefully lower costs. Some, some good stuff, but it's going to take a while. Yeah. Stay tuned. Yeah. And speaking of electric airplanes, eVTOL, electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, are the big buzz in some circles, particularly in Silicon Valley, where companies like Uber envision a near future of autonomous passenger carrying eVTOLs flitting from skyscrapers roof to roof. eVTOLs will make our lives easier, our commutes shorter, and our cities cleaner and more productive. They'll fundamentally change how our cities function and how we live in them. At NASA, my team and I spent decades researching the technology that enables this, Distributed Electric Propulsion, or DEP. Uber just completed the second Elevate conference where the Brainiacs get together to talk about this bold new future. Three new concept flying machines debuted at Elevate. Embraer announced the Dream Maker out of its Melbourne, Florida factory. The Brazilian manufacturer has also established innovation teams in Silicon Valley and in Boston. The Dream Maker is fairly conventional with eight electric motor-driven rotors and a tail fan. Karam's aircraft's idea uses four rotors, which Karam says causes less noise, and Pipistrel's EV toll machines have no visible rotors at all, just two propulsion devices for vertical and forward thrust. Pipistrel says the bat wing machine will go well, <laughs> like a bat out of you know where. Well, the eVTO proponents say a conventional helicopter just won't work in this future urban transportation environment, but they're doing just fine right now, thank you. Helicopters are the bright spot in the General Aviation Manufacturers Association's first quarter report of aircraft sales. Piston helicopter sales up nearly 40%. Turbine whirlybirds, a modest 7% improvement. Piston engine airplanes, well, they're down a little. 200 shipped last quarter. This week in Alaska, there were airplanes that landed just about like helicopters. The Valdez fly-in took place this week. It's best known for the short takeoff and landing competition. The shortest landing this year? Another world record. Dan Reynolds landed his Chinook in just nine and a half feet. The winner of the competition was Frank Knapp in a highly modified Cub. He had an 11-foot takeoff and a 22-foot landing, giving him the shortest total in the competition. <laughs> So I, I've attended that a couple of times. Uh -huh. How about yourself? It's I have not. I saw the one that we had, the uh, demonstration we had at uh, Norman, Oklahoma last uh, summer. And we have another 
sort of uh, preview event uh, on stole competition coming up in Missoula. It's it, a lot uh, of fun to watch. So, so yeah, yeah. Come, out, come out and see it. It is a, fun, a lot of fun to watch. Amazing what those guys can do. It is. <laughs> well, it's a worse nightmare for most pilots, an engine failure close to the ground. It's only made worse when you're flying a rare and beautiful P-51 Mustang, and that is the exact situation Mark Levy found himself in. He recently sat down with Richard McSpadden, Executive Director of AOPA's Air Safety Institute, to share video of the flight and talk about what happened. So here you're coming through on your last pass, literally your last pass to go into the overhead yep. and, uh, and do what we call the breakout and land. Yep. And so you were, uh, you were telling me you were, uh, you were in the middle of an echelon move, so which is, um, for, the, for the sake of our audience, as you're in the turn, and you're going to the breakout, the lead has moved you to the other side of the formation. That's right, yep. So you're moving from the left side, you're in this move to the right side of the formation in the number three position, and then? Well, obviously there's a certain amount of uh, throttle movement to stabilize in the formation, and as I was pulling up next to the number two airplane, the engine quit. And then it started again. So I think, like, well, it must have been something, so I started to move back up again, move the throttle again, it quit again this time for a lot longer and I realized pretty much at that point hey you're gonna have to deal with this so I'm now kind of regressing to um, patterns of behavior which I've been grained over over years yeah so I'm getting the airplane at the right speed I crank the canopy open because obviously I don't want the canopy shutting me if I'm gonna put the airplane down and I'm thinking okay this is not my best day but I'm actually in a good position. I'm in a low key position for a good field. And then the engine starts again. Mm. This is not an engine failure. This is a intermittent partial engine failure. Yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, we talked about this. This is probably much more dangerous than a straight engine quitting. Yeah. I was maybe at four or 500 feet. 150 miles an hour with the engine running kind of intermittently and I've got maybe I've got to go sort of down the second half of the downwind leg I've got to turn base base to final but I'm thinking hey I might be able to make this and then I made another mistake mm. at that point the tower I could see I'd, they'd heard my call I was kind of approaching base leg and they started to shout at me your gear's not down your gear's not down so I put the gear down yeah at which point the engine started to run down again so mm. I've now got drag Mm. Uh, I've, got a, I've got 180 degrees of turn to go, and that was a dumb thing to do. Clearly it's going to be an off-airport air landing, pulled the gear up, dumped the remaining flat, rolled the wings level, and continued to fly it. This is the key thing, Richard. Fly the airplane as far into the crash as you can, and that's kind of in the back of my head. Three's down and safe. It was a nice thought. Unfortunately, the antenna's under the wing, and that was snapped off somewhere back in the wreckage <laughs> okay. trail. So they didn't hear it. Yeah. But okay. you know, I'm, I'm thinking of my buddies. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was a good. It was a good thing to think about. You wrote a great article, uh, Mark, that you shared with me on it, and in that you sort of summarized the things that you were happy with of how you did and the things that you would do differently. And the first thing is, I just appreciated that that's the way you think, that you come out of this thing and, and you were able to save yourself and cause no damage to any other people, the airplane will be fixed. And yet, just talking through you, I can still th see you thinking through the next time this happens, this is what I would do differently, which to me, is such an important piece of our culture in aviation. That's how we get safer and safer. We're not sure. afraid to put it on the table and say, these were the facts. This is what I would do differently if I could do it again. You can find a full analysis of the flight with the lessons learned on the Air Safety Institute homepage. That was amazing. Uh, it is, that was. I mean, can you believe uh, what, what's going through his mind, the steps, uh, the, the desire you'd have to go ahead and try to make it to the runway and probably run out of energy and crash as opposed to taking the field. Yeah, it's, it's definitely worth a watch. Yep. <laughs> Coming up after the break, all the reasons why you should come to Missoula, Montana fly-in. Reflecting on 100 years of airmail. And honoring volunteer pilots at a star-studded event. 
Meet the pilots who fly with AOPA Insurance. They love flying and saving money, just like you. At AOPA Insurance, we understand how you fly and provide the coverage you need to keep on flying. Call for a free quote and see which AOPA Insurance plan is right for you. Well, hey, the kids are all right, at least one of them. Murfreesboro Aviation in Tennessee says Tom Tippin has earned his private pilot certificate at age 17. Tom is the son of country music star Aaron Tippin, who was also Tom's instructor up to solo. And we told you about Tom's solo, well, solos actually, when he soloed a Cub, a Stearman, and a T6 on his 16th birthday. Congratulations, Tom, way to go. And there's a fly-in coming up that's targeting young aviators. The event is for those who are young in age and young at heart. It will take place at the beautiful Triple Tree Aerodrome in South Carolina on June 8th to 10th. Attendees get a chance to go to seminars, meet other pilots, and experience all that Triple Tree has to offer. You can RSVP at the Triple Tree website. And AOPA has a special opportunity for a pilot between the ages of 18 and 24. One lucky winner will get the trip of a lifetime to participate in an air race across France. The goal of the race is to motivate the next generation of pilots, build camaraderie, and promote general aviation. The two-week getaway will include round-trip airfare to France, airplane rental for the race, fuel, lodging, and meals. To enter, send a 500-word essay describing your passion for flight and your flying experience to the email address there on your screen. Time is sneaking up on you. Time to plan for AOPA's first regional fly-in of the year in Missoula, Montana. Warren Morningstar joins us now. So Warren, what's cool about Missoula? Hey, well, hey, Melissa. You know, they say a uh, river runs through it. And if you're talking about Missoula, that's quite literally the case. This is the Clark Fork River. It runs through the center of Missoula. We're just a few steps from downtown. And it, uh, the Clark Fork River was also the location of both the novel and the movie, A River Runs Through It. The Clark Fork also flows past Missoula International Airport, home to our host, North Star Jet. I took off from there for a preview of one of the three exciting fly-outs scheduled for this fly-in. I'm headed for the Crystal Creek Airport and the Stonehenge Aviation Museum. Why Stonehenge? Well, you'll see in a minute. And as you can see, flying in Montana is absolutely breathtaking even when circumnavigating thunderstorms. Crystal Lake is the private strip right next to the Stonehenge Museum. And yes, that's a Stonehenge replica on the private golf course just off the approach end, hence the name. And there's only one approach. With a three degree runway slope, you land uphill and you take off downhill. <laughs> Dang, I hate it when my off center line landings are caught on video. The golf course, airport museum, and some 1,400 acres, the private grounds of inventor and businessman Jim Smith. He doesn't care much for talking on camera, but he loves airplanes. It started as a young boy. He um, just made hundreds of airplane models, and then he started his own business and um, never got a chance to fly until he was about 40. When he retired, he just started collecting airplanes. That's his daughter, Jerry, who helps run the museum. A Fokker replica. Uh -huh. And then we also have a P-51, a Corsair, a 1917 Curtis Jenny. Or how about this P-40? A farmer bought it for nuts and bolts and then buried it. And it was buried for about 20 years. And then someone caught wind of it and they went and actually excavated it out of the ground and the pH balance of the soil had preserved the metal and so it was actually in pretty good shape, just missing some nuts and bolts. But the star of the collection, a submarine sea fire. Has the counter rotating props because of the engine um, being so powerful. This is the only surviving example of this model and yes, it can still fly. In fact, all of the aircraft in the collection are airworthy. And well, except maybe this, or this. Your visit to the Stonehenge Air Museum will be a unique opportunity to see some beautiful and historically important aircraft, and a chance to see some beautiful scenery on the way. Yeah, so Tom and Melissa, I gotta tell you, I think this is our most beautiful fly-in location yet. Then again, maybe I'm a bit biased because I learned to fly in the mountains.
Thanks, Warren. The Missoula Fly-In is June 15th and 16th. You can register on our website and find out about everything you can experience in Missoula. There's also a video to brief you on the special flight procedures for the event. And last weekend, pilots who use their airplanes to make a difference received some much deserved recognition. The fifth annual Endeavor Awards Gala took place under the Space Shuttle in the California Science Center. Among the awards is the 2018 Inspiration Award. This year it was presented to AOPA Board of Trustees member and former CEO of Alaska Airlines, Bill Ayer. Bill is a volunteer pilot for Angel Flight, a nonprofit that provides free medical flights for those in need. Um, the real heroes in this equation are the Angel Flight passengers, folks that are dealing with uh, real critical situations, life-threatening situations in many cases, and I want to thank them for allowing the volunteers at Angel Flight to hopefully provide a little, a little bit brighter day for them. The Endeavor Awards Gala also recognizes U.S. astronauts and members of the military. The event raised more than 300000 for Angel Flight West. This was my first year oh, yeah? to get to go to the Endeavor Awards, and it's amazing. I w and congratulations to Bill right. for, for winning and the other award recipients. And what was neat this year, anyway, they had some of the patients present oh. the award to the, the pilot, oh, nice. so it was really special. Yeah, uh, people doing great things with airplanes. 100 years ago this week, snail mail suddenly became a bit, well, zippier. A modified JN4 Jenny took off from a small polo field near what is now the National Mall in Washington, D.C. The Army had hurriedly installed a bigger engine and more fuel capacity in the trainer. President Wilson was there to witness the post office load letters and newspapers into what had been the front cockpit of the airplane. First airmail service between Washington and New York had begun. Army pilots flew the limited airmail routes for the first few months, then post office pilots, and then contract pilots like the famous Elry Jepson. Earlier this month, the post office issued a commemorative forever stamp depicting that first flight. You still send mail? Buy a bunch. They're supposed to be good forever. And those first airmail flights had about as many crashes as successes. There were no maps, no beacons, even the compass on those early aircraft was unreliable. But within two years, airmail pilots flew the transcontinental route from New York to San Francisco. More routes followed, as did the National Airway Beacon System to help pilots find their way at night. One of those early routes went up the west coast of the U.S. AOPA Live's Josh Cochran has the story about a group of pilots going on a journey this week to experience what it was like to be an airmail pilot. Addison Pemberton is passionate about sharing the history of airmail with the public. So passionate he's taking a journey up the West Coast. And we're going to be flying an historic recreation of CAM contract airmail Route 8 from San Diego to Seattle. He's taking the trip along with two other steermans. These steermans behind you are quite unique. They're actually called speed mails. They were designed specifically as airmail carriers. My aircraft in the background was owned by American Airways that predated American Airlines. It operated between uh, Chicago and Dallas every night. The uh, airplane to my right is also an ex-American airplane. American operated 12 of the 41 speed mails built. So these were purpose-built airmail carriers designed in 1929 and they were produced until 1931. Airmail is an important part of commercial aviation history. The revenue from mail delivery gave air carriers the resources to grow and ultimately carry passengers. The Kelly Act passed in 1926 and let airmail contracts to individual operators, which today is our airline operators that we know. The journey also gives Pemberton and his fellow pilots an appreciation for what it was like to fly mail a hundred years ago. As you fly along and leave the major cities, you can put your mind back in 1920. Once you leave the cities, that river, that lake, that mountain peak looked just like that in 1921. So you can kind of put yourself back in that time zone. So it's a very accurate recreation of exactly what they experienced. The journey helps recognize the work of these brave pioneers in aviation. I just want to bring this pioneer airmail pilot story to the general public so that people understand the significance of the U.S. Post Office and the airspace system that we all enjoy today. Josh Cochran, AOPA Live. What an adventure. <laughs> I guess so. At least they didn't have all that airspace around L.A. to deal with on the way through, I suppose. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> and that'll do it for us this week. Thanks so much for watching. We hope to see you back here next Thursday for another edition of AOPA Live This Week. <laughs>